Hi everyone, I'm Dr. DeSuter. I'm going to talk to you today about common disorders and treatments of the foot and ankle. First, a little bit about myself. So I was born in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So it's that province that's in the purple there on the left side of the map. Um, so that's where I was born and raised and I did my undergraduate degree there in kinesiology and exercise and health physiology where I did a lot of research as well. And then I went off and did medical school at the University of Alberta, which is just north there, right where there's that little star in the middle of the purple colored province on the left side of the screen. I did my orthopedic surgery residency there for five years as well. And then I flew all the way down east to Nova Scotia. So it's that province in, in the orange there where I did my fellowship in foot and ankle reconstruction and sports with Dr. Mark Glazeberg and Dr. Joel Morash. It was a great year. And then came on down to the Core Institute here in Phoenix to help take care of your guys' feet and ankle problems. So the foot and ankle, it's actually a, quite a bit of a complex joint, actually multiple joints, I should say, um, consisting of the ankle, which is made up of three bones, the tibia, fibula, and talus, and the foot would actually consist of 26 bones, the calcaneus, talus, navicular, cuboid, three cuneiforms, five metatarsals, and multiple phalanges that make up the five toes. The foot is an amazing structure that actually takes a lot of force every single day. When you're walking, about one and a half times body weight goes through your foot with each step. When you're running, that even increases about fivefold, anywhere from three to seven times your body weight. On average, the person takes about 3,000 to 4,000 steps per day. So when you do all the math on this, it equates to about a million pounds of force per foot per day. So it's a pretty uh, special structure in order to handle that with everyone's activities. So now I'm going to talk to you about some conditions of the foot and ankle. The first one I'm going to talk about is arthritis. So this is a disorder that affects joints. It doesn't just affect joints in your foot and ankle, it could happen anywhere throughout the body. People often feel joint pain, stiffness, decreased range of motion, and there's two main types of arthritis. Osteoarthritis, which is the degenerative type, and rheumatoid arthritis, which is an inflammatory or autoimmune type of arthritis. This shows a picture of an ankle with extreme severe arthritis with tilting of the talus bone. For osteoarthritis, this is the degenerative type. This is where there's a breakdown of cartilage. So when the cartilage wears down, you lose that shock absorber effect that absorbs the impact that our feet deal with day in and day out. So when you lose that shock absorber, then you get bone on bone, which results in pain and stiffness, also inflammation of the joint as well. Rheumatoid arthritis is a little bit different. This is an autoimmune disease where the immune system attacks one's joints, causing inflammation of the joint lining. This affects the joint capsule as well as the surrounding ligaments and soft tissues. This often leads to pain, but in addition, also deformity as well. This is an example in this x-ray here of someone who has rheumatoid arthritis with significant forefoot deformity. And then on the picture on the right, it shows an x-ray after surgery, correcting the lesser toes as well as the big toe to get into a straight position. For treatments of arthritis, initially what we do first is non-operative treatment. This can include medications, activity modification, physical therapy, supportive footwear, orthotics and bracing, and then once one has exhausted all non-operative treatments, we look at doing surgery. For medications, one of the more common drugs that we use is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. Some different types of NSAIDs include ibuprofen, Celebrex, diclofenac, as well as naproxen. People also try Tylenol for pain control. One of the things I often prescribe as well is topical anti-inflammatory creams such as Voltaren, um, which also gets pain control right at the source. Especially this is very helpful for people that cannot take oral anti-inflammatories due to maybe previous issues with gastric ulcers or other kidney concerns. One of the other treatments we do non-operatively is activity modification. This could be increasing physical activity, doing particularly low impact activities, to help lessen the forces on the joints while still being active, working on increasing strengthening and flexibility. Also weight loss plays an important role as well as this does help with decreasing the forces through one's joints of the ankle and foot. In addition, one can use ambulatory aids such as a cane, walker, or a knee scooter that I commonly prescribe as well if one needs to offload their foot and ankle. Physical therapy also plays an important role help us work on one's strengthening, work on range of motion of one's joints. Also, there's other modalities that can help with pain control, such as massage, ultrasound, as well as pool therapy, which is an excellent tool in order to help decrease the forces but still remain active. 
Supportive footwear and bracing it plays in a very important role as well. I always recommend people wear supportive footwear, whether it's a good running shoe or having an orthotic, even over-the-counter type orthotics can help lessen the impacts and forces on one's foot. Also, bracing it can play a role as well. On the image on the right shows a picture of a lace-up AFO brace that one commonly uses when people have ankle arthritis. And then the orthotics on the middle of the screen show a gel type over-the-counter insert and then the one on the bottom in the middle there shows one for individuals that have what's called hallux rigidus or arthritis of their big toe. It's a nice stiff soled shank there in order to help prevent motion of the toe treating for pain. When all those non-operative treatments fail, one can consider surgery for treatment of their ankle arthritis. Some of the more common procedures that are done are ankle arthroscopy, where we actually clean up the joint synovitis or inflammation of the tissue. This could also be done in a more open, larger incision procedure as well. This picture on the screen here shows an image of an ankle arthroscopy looking inside the joint, and on the right side of the screen shows some scar tissue that's present there that we look to remove. Other surgical procedures used to treat ankle arthritis include ankle arthrodesis, or what's called fusion surgery, as well as ankle joint replacement. So ankle arthrodesis is commonly used for moderate to severe ankle arthritis. This used to be the gold standard for treatment for ankle arthritis. And this is a picture that shows one of the many types of plates and screw constructs that we use for treatment with an ankle fusion. With ankle arthrodesis, it's a great procedure for people that are younger in age, in addition that are quite active on their feet, who have like high impact related jobs. But there's also some downsides of ankle arthrodesis as well. It can lead to a stiff joint, so you do lose some range of motion of the ankle. So the other bones and joints of your foot have to compensate. Often people have a little bit of a slower walking speed, but not too much. And in the long term, when we're looking at 10, 15, even 20 years down the road, it can lead to arthritis of the other joints of the foot. One of the newer technologies that's making great strides over the last decade to 20 years has been ankle replacements. So it shows some pictures here of some ankle replacements uh, that are commonly done. One thing with ankle replacements allows the maintenance of the joint motion, decreases pain in the ankle, and in the long term, decreases progression of arthritis in the surrounding joints. One thing with ankle replacements though, ankle replacements are not meant for everyone though, especially people that have high impact jobs as ankle replacements just have decreased longevity compared to ankle arthrodesis that usually once one heals with an ankle arthrodesis is good for life. These pictures here to show some of the new technologies that are coming through and actually being more commonly used, including by my, myself, with regards to using CT scans in order to template one's ankle replacement so that cut guides can be made and constructed that are custom to the patient so that we get the ankle replacements in the exact spot that they need to be. So this shows some pictures of the technology there, including the cut guides on the left side of the screen. Arthritis just doesn't affect the ankle joint, as we talked about earlier. It can affect other parts of the foot and ankle as well as the body. With the image on the left, this shows a screw construct that's used in order to do a subtalar fusion for people that have arthritis between their calcaneus, heel bone, as well as the talus. The picture in the middle of the screen there shows someone who has hallux rigidus or first MTP joint arthritis using a screw and plate construct in order to fuse the bones. And then the pictures on the right shows a before and after picture of someone who has midfoot arthritis using screws in order to fuse the joints. Fusion means I take away any cartilage that's left in the joint and then I use screws or any plate construct in order to keep the bones together by having no motion at those joints decreases pain. Next, I'm gonna move on to some slip and fall type injuries that are common, including ankle sprains, perineal tendon tears, fifth metatarsal Jones fractures, ankle fractures, as well as Achilles tendon ruptures. Ankle sprain, one of the most common injuries one encounters, whether you're an athlete or you have a slip and fall downstairs or just tripping off a curb, okay? Um, common associated with an ankle sprain is ankle pain. You people will have swelling, bruising, and depending on the severity of the injury, often people have inability to walk or put any weight down on their foot. This shows a picture here of the ligaments on the outside of the ankle or the lateral aspect of the ankle. The most common ligament to be injured in one that has an ankle sprain is the anterior talofibular ligament there. So that's the ligament that's a little more in red color that's present. 
For treatment, for ankle sprains, usually the first thing we do is non-operative treatment. This includes rest, ice, and elevation. Depending on the severity of the injury, I may put someone in a brace, or if it's more severe ankle sprain, put them in a cast boot. Medications are prescribed, including anti-inflammatory medications that help with swelling control. In addition, prescribing physical therapy as well in the more chronic or long-term picture, if one fails all these non-operative treatments, I look to do surgery to help treat the instability for a chronic tear of the ligaments. This is an example of one of the common braces that I prescribe for patients that have ankle sprains. It's a lace-up ankle brace that wraps around the ankle, providing stability. Another common injury that one encounters, also quite common when one has an ankle sprain, is the perineal tendon tear. Other situations where these injuries happen is in athletic injuries, also people that have chronic overuse injuries. Depending on the severity and the pain, I usually treat these non-operatively initially with initial cast immobilization, typically in a walking boot. Also activity modification as well. As the tendon is quite inflamed, I want to settle the symptoms down of the inflammation before moving on to physical therapy or in addition to treating it with Voltaren or anti-inflammatory cream. If one fails these non-operative treatments, then one would consider doing surgery in order to debride the tendon or repair the tendon if it's torn. The two tendons for the perineal tendons include the perineus brevis tendon, as well as the perineus longus tendon that's shown in these pictures here. Another common injury that happens is the fifth metatarsal fracture. This is the long bone on the side of the foot on the outside. This is common in people that have high arch or cavus feet. Also, it's quite common for people to have plantar flexion inversion injuries when they trip over their foot. The pictures on the right show a Jones type fracture there where there's a fifth metatarsal fracture that was treated with surgery with a screw construct. Other treatments though is using a stiff sole shoe or a walking boot or a cast, depending on the patient's choice. Ankle fractures, also a very common injury to happen whenever someone slips and falls. And as you can see from the pictures across here, depending on how one trips over their foot or falls on their foot, dictates many different injury mechanisms that one can occur. Common treatment for this, no matter what the injury or severity is, always rice, so rest, ice, compression, and elevation to help treat the swelling control. If it's an ankle fracture that does not require any surgery, I get them in a walking boot, cast boot, or a cast. But oftentimes, depending on the ankle fracture, especially if it has injury to both the fibula as well as the tibia, often needs surgical intervention with usually plates and screw constructs to get you fixed up. Another common injury is the Achilles tendon rupture. So these common in sports injuries where someone feels a pop at the back of their ankle. Usually this is quite common in people that are the weekend warriors that haven't done sports in a while and then they go back playing some sports on the weekend, playing soccer, and then they feel a pop in the ankle and it feels like someone has kicked them in the back leg when there's no one there. Also, the, another risk factor for Achilles tendon ruptures are people that have like steroid injections in their Achilles tendon. So if someone says that they want to do an injection of your Achilles tendon area, tell them no, because it does increase your risk of Achilles tendon ruptures. So like I said here, patient reports pop when they have an injury, and then they also have weakness in walking as well, so it's hard to push off your toes. Treatment can be both done surgically with surgery as well as non-operatively. With non-operative treatment, you're looking at doing a functional rehabilitation protocol where one is quite active working with physical therapy on their recovery or their surgery where there's both open type procedures to repair your Achilles tendon as well as a percutaneous type procedure where there's a smaller incision. And this shows an example of a percutaneous type surgical procedure that I commonly do in order to get your Achilles tendon repaired with just a small incision. Now we're gonna move into like other conditions looking at foot pain, including heel pain, plantar fasciitis, tarsal tunnel syndrome, calcaneal stress fractures. We'll look at a little bit at flat foot, pes planus foot deformities, as well as high arch feet or cable varus foot. We'll look at bunions or hallux valgus deformities, arthritis of the great toe, hallux rigidus, as well as looking at hammer toes. Heel pain. With plantar fasciitis, it's one of the most common conditions one deals with when it comes to foot and ankle pain. And it's one of the things I see commonly in my clinic as well. So people that have plantar fasciitis usually have pain right at the heel region. That's worse in the morning after the first few steps. Also after periods of rest and starting to walk again, you get the pain as well. Common treatments that I use for plantar fasciitis include 
activity modification, stretching, physical therapy. I make sure to prescribe cushion custom orthotic to help offload the heel. In addition, sometimes depending on the severity of it, I will offer a Voltaren cream as well as a cortisone injection. Often these are treated without any operations, but if people have symptoms for over a year or have quite tight muscles of their calf muscles, oftentimes I need to do releases of the calf muscle as well as the plantar fascia for treatment, but this is rarely occurs. Another common condition of the heel region is tarsal tunnel syndrome. This is where people have compression of the nerve that goes along the bottom of their foot. Tinel sign that I mentioned here on the PowerPoint slide is a test that I do where I tap along the nerve to see if that reproduces any symptoms in your foot. So you'll commonly see me do that if you have this condition in clinic. One of the ways I look at investigating tarsal tunnel syndrome is I get an MRI to make sure there's no compressive masses on there. I also get nerve conduction studies and electromyographic studies in order to look at the muscle and nerve function and see if it's working normally. If there's ever any compressure on the nerve, I always can do a release of the tarsal tunnel. Another common injury that happens at the heel with heel pain is calcaneal stress fractures. People can often get this as they get older with osteoporosis. Also, even with just no traumatic incident, people can get a stress fracture as well. Usually, if I do a squeeze test on your heel, that would reproduce the pain. And often, we'll get an MRI scan in order to rule out a stress fracture. So as I talked about earlier with regards to plantar fasciitis, physical therapy, stretching, as well as ultrasound treatments can help. Orthotics, I often can prescribe night splints, so you can pick them up online as well to help keep your foot stretched at nighttime so that it's not stiff in the morning. Anti-inflammatories such as Voltaren topical anti-inflammatory cream or ibuprofen, as well as cortisone injections in the area. This shows a picture of where the injection occurs. Next, I'll move into flat foot or pes planus foot deformities. There's many names and for this condition can include plano valgus feet, in addition to posterior tibial tendon insufficiency or dysfunction. As you can see, these pictures on the middle of the screen here shows a person with bilateral or both-sided flat feet. That shows quite a flat arch. You can't even see the arch on these pictures here. Some of the treatments I use for flat foot or pes planus foot deformities include an ankle foot orthosis, this is a custom one example here that's shown on the right side of the screen. I also recommend custom orthotics that provide an arch support for a patient. If people have severe pain and they have inflammation of their posterior tibial tendon, sometimes I put them in a cast boot or a cast in order to help settle their symptoms down. And when one fails all these non-operative treatments with continued pain, then based on their foot deformity, how flexible it is or if it's rigid would dictate some of the soft tissue procedures that I would do as well as corrective osteotomies in order to help reposition the foot. But if one often has arthritis of their joints, I would often do fusions for someone with a flat foot deformity if required. Next, we move on to cable varus foot or a high arch foot. The picture on the right side of the screen shows someone with a high arch of their foot, quite opposite compared to the previous image here, which had a flat foot. There's many causes for someone who has a cable varus foot. Sometimes it just happens on one foot or it can happen bilaterally on both feet as well. Causes can include trauma, also neurological conditions such as charcot-marie tooth, or sometimes it can just develop without any cause, also known as idiopathic. Some of the treatments for cable varus high arch feet include orthotics, AFO or an ankle foot orthosis, as well as bracing. But if one often fails these non-operative treatments, including pain control medications, then you can consider surgery and then based on their foot and where the deformity is at would dictate what type of soft tissue procedures I would do. If there's bony reconstruction where I do corrective osteotomies to get the foot in an appropriate position or if there's arthritis associated and it's a rigid deformity then I may consider fusions of some of the joints as well. This is an example of an orthotic on the bottom right side of the screen that shows one that has provides arch support for one's foot. Hallux valgus or bunions. These are very common conditions, more common in females. Some of the causes include hereditary. So if your mother had it, you may also get it as well. Trauma can uh, lead to hallux valgus or bunion deformity, improper shoe wear. So people that enjoy wearing high heels can increase your risk for 
Halix valgus deformis. Also, if one has inflammation of the joints, that is quite common with individuals that have rheumatoid arthritis, it can lead to a bunion type deformity. Some of the treatments that I would like to do for one that has Halix valgus or bunion type deformities, including shoe wear modifications. So one should wear a wide toe box shoe as well as a larger shoe that would accommodate one's foot. I also recommend toe spacers. That's shown in the middle of the screen there. That's a nice gel toe spacer to help align the toes. In addition, one can use a bunion brace that's shown on the left side of the screen. And then if one fails all these non-operative treatments, including pain medications, then we look to doing corrective surgery. So the image on the right side of the screen shows an x-ray of a person that had a lapidus type procedure where they had a first tarsal metatarsal fusion, as well as an Aiken osteotomy, it's called, where of the great toe, there's a correction of the bone of the great toe. And then on the right there, there's a wire that's placed in the patient's second toe because they had a hammer toe. So that's a correction of the hammer toe with a wire. That moves me right on to the topic of hammer toes. These are also common um, conditions one has where there's deformity of the lesser toes, looking at the second, third, fourth, and fifth toes. Some people could have curly toes as well, or these are, there's so many different deformities depending on what joint it's at, whether it's at the metatarsal phalangeal joint, the PIP joint, or in between the middle phalanx and distal phalanx of the toe. So this shows a picture of a uh, schematic drawing of it, as well as someone's foot that has hammer toes present. One of the things I offer for people with hammer toes is making sure one has a tall toe box shoe to prevent any callus development on the top part of their toes. There's also these orthopedic appliances called boot and splints that's shown on the right side of the screen where it helps to bring the toe down. And this is helpful for people who have flexible hammer toe deformities. They don't quite work as well with someone with a rigid toe deformity. If there's ever any issues still with non-operative treatment and one continues to have pain and deformity, then we could look at doing hammer toe correction surgery. The image on the left side of the screen shows an x-ray where there's K-wires placed in one's toe after they've been corrected and straightened out. Uh, in addition to having to put those wires through one's toes, which I know is quite scary for some people, but they, they, do, they do the job to get it done. I also had to take and fuse the joints. Sometimes I have to lengthen the tendons and open up the joint capsules as well to get the toe correction done. So you do lose a little bit of motion of the toes, but you have straight toes that don't rub on your shoe, which is a great thing for most people. And that takes it to the end of my presentation. Hopefully this was informative for all of you. You could always come and see me in clinic if you have, your, have any foot or ankle concerns or conditions. So always book an appointment whenever you need to see me. But we'll take some questions now from everyone that's in on this webinar. So neuropathy is an abnormal sensation often people feel in their feet. Also nerve pains, tingliness sensation they would also get as well. For people that have diabetes, the one of the most important things you can do to help the progression of your neuropathy is to make sure you have your diabetes under control, making sure you have good blood glucose control and keeping that hemo hemoglobin A1C under seven if at all possible. Some of the treatments that do for neuropathy includes shoe wear modifications, making sure one wears sh supportive shoe wear, having good cushioned orthotics and help absorb some of the impact on one's foot. Other things can include pain medications such as neuropathic pain medications such as gabapentin or Lyrica. Other things I do prescribe is some Voltaren anti-inflammatory cream or lidocaine type creams or some things to use for also treatments. So signs and symptoms of one that sprains their ankle can include swelling, there's going to be bruising, usually it's over the area where the ligament that was injured. One could have pain with walking or any mobility on their foot. In addition to that, sometimes people, depending on how severe the ankle sprain is, sometimes it can affect the nerves and get numbness and pins and needles feeling in one's foot. Common treatments that you use for treating one's ankle sprain includes rest, ice, as well as elevation for help with the swelling control. Sometimes you need to use a brace in order to help it. But oftentimes, um, non-operative treatment is what one needs in order to treat their ankle sprain. And depending on the severity, it dictates how long it takes to recover. But oftentimes, after a few months, 90 to 95% people recover without ever needing any surgery.
So unfortunately, once one gets the deformity of the bunion or hallux valgus, they often don't go away at this point in time. We can only do symptomatic type treatments, non-operative treatments in order to help decrease some of the symptoms or the pain that you may have associated with the bunion deformity. So some of the things that I had mentioned before, I'll go to, oh, includes using bunion braces or toe spacers, also pain medications such as anti-inflammatories or topical Voltaren anti-inflammatory cream is something I would look as well. I'm just gonna go, sorry, I'm just gonna go a little bit ahead here. So these are some of the treatments that I would recommend trying here for someone who has that hallux valgus or bunion type deformity if one wants to avoid surgery. But unfortunately we can't correct it to uh, be back to normal as it once was before. So these are three common conditions for heel pain. It could be plantar fasciitis, tarsal tunnels, or calcaneal stress fractures. But there's other many other conditions that can cause heel pain. Someone may have a ganglion cyst or a little... So there's many conditions that could cause heel pain. One would best be assessed um, in order to help determine the right diagnosis for that individual in order to provide appropriate treatment for them. So with the total ankle replacement, the longevity of them is increasing significantly over the last couple of decades. Ankle replacements in the right person has about a 90 to 95% longevity at the 10 year mark. With someone who is 53 years old, this could be the right procedure for you if you have ankle arthritis and depending on the activities that you want it to do as well. If someone is a very highly active individual that wants to do a lot of running, I probably would not recommend doing ankle replacement because the longevity of it would be a lot less than 10 years. But if one is a very sedentary type individual that just wants to have pain relief with an ankle replacement, that could be a great option for you. The one thing is with regards to ankle replacements, if you're quite young and have 30, 40, 50, and who knows and as the future goes how long we're going to be living, oftentimes you may need a revision or replacement or sometimes onto a fusion afterwards. So it's important to speak with a surgeon like myself to figure out the best treatment for you for your ankle arthritis. So cortisone injections are safe for people with plantar fasciitis. I know I mentioned earlier in my lecture saying not to do any cortisone injections around the Achilles tendon. The one reason why I say that is because there's risk of rupture of the Achilles tendon. In the plantar fascia, it's a very broad tendon that Due to that, it's very, very rare for one to have a rupture of the tendon associated with a cortisone injection. Usually with cortisone injections, you could do them at most once every three to four months, but after a few injections, I would probably recommend not doing it if it's not providing much relief any longer. But it, usually I don't do more than two or three in a year. So gout is due to crystals that deposit in the joint. Commonly in the foot, it happens in the first MDP joint or the great toe joint, also common in the ankle joint. Versus arthritis is just a breakdown and deterioration of cartilage. If it's an osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis is where it's an autoimmune condition where it affects the synovial joint capsule lining of the joint. So big gout is the crystal deposit that leads to inflammation of one's joint. Often with the crystals associated with gout, when they are deposited, and cause inflammation and pain, it can lead to arthritis of the joint as well, and sometimes it does require surgery for treatment. So that's a very general, very broad question, but physical therapy, often sometimes, depending on what's one condition is, I do refer someone to physical therapy, and they will work on things such as range of motion, they can work on strengthening, they can work on proprioception, sometimes it's balancing gait that one needs to work on. So there's a variety of different types of therapy that a physical therapist will prescribe as well in order to help best treat the patient for what the condition they have and what they want to work on. So plantar fasciitis and heel spurs kind of go hand in hand because the spur is often what develops after the plantar fasciitis progresses with time with that constant inflammatory state where it lays down extra bone in that area. So often based on clinical exams, usually it's the plantar fasciitis that people have that's the pain, not so much on the heel spurs.
100%, this can cause further problems up, up your leg. When one has, for example, a foot deformity, such as a pes planus foot deformity or a varus type high arch foot, it leads to different mechanics for the rest of their leg, which can lead to knee problems or hip problems. Or sometimes it works the other way around. Someone may have hip arthritis or knee arthritis with a knee deformity above that puts pressure and um, deterioration on one's foot and ankle. So it's important it upon one's assessment to my assessment in particular when I'm looking at you to make sure you do the proper treatment. And sometimes often I do refer to my colleagues as well. If someone has knee arthritis or hip arthritis in order to have this treated as well. So we work as a team in order to make sure your pain and symptoms are treated appropriately, especially when deformity is present. Well, the important thing is to make sure that one always watches one's weight. So especially when it comes down to around the holiday season and Thanksgiving coming up here, it's always important to make sure we eat healthy, make sure that we get exercise. I recommend doing low impact ex exercises as well. That helps keep us healthy. In addition with the nutrition, make sure we have appropriate vitamin D intake. Even though we're in a very sunny state where we could get lots of sunshine to help with our vitamin D intake, in particular in the winters, we may get a little less sunshine, so it's important to have vitamin D as well as calcium supplements in your diet to make sure your bones stay strong. So with regards to Morton's neuromas, these are benign nerve lesions, growths that occur on the nerves that go between your toes, of the lesser toes most commonly. Sometimes people can have pain, especially if there's any squeezing at the forefoot. They could have abnormal sensation going into between their toes. Further to that as well, anytime someone's walking on their forefoot, they might have pain there as well. Some of the treatments that I do for people with Morton's neuromas include supportive footwear, prescribe a custom orthotic with like a metatarsal pad in order to help offload the forefoot or the toe area. In addition, trying pain medications such as anti-inflammatories. I recommend patients to wear wide toe box type shoes to help accommodate their foot to prevent any squeezing on the Morton's neuroma. I also try cortisone injections, which can work about 25 to 33% of the time. If all those things do fail, then one thing that one can consider is doing an excision of their Morton's neuroma through surgery. So commonly people back in the day used to treat these with whacking them with a book in order to treat them that way, in order to decompress the cyst. Often though, this comes back when that treatment method is used. Um, sometimes ganglion cysts can fluctuate in their size sometimes because it's usually coming from a joint typically. So sometimes it may be small or maybe big. Some of the treatments that one can use in order to treat a ganglion cyst includes doing, putting a needle in it in order to decompress it or injecting with cortisone as well. Often these still have high recurrence as well. So sometimes if it's painful and symptomatic enough, usually surgical excision is required in order to remove the ganglion cyst. But even with doing a surgical excision, they do can come back as well. So depending on what location they're specifically talking about, if it's right at the tip of the toe or on the side of the foot at the base of the metatarsal, sometimes people would just, a foot defor deformity common like cable various type feet or high arch feet, it does put abnormal pressures on this area of the foot so that can lead to pain. Some people do not have a lot of soft tissue on that side of their foot as well, especially as one ages. So sometimes recommending a cushion orthotic and supportive shoe can help offload this area in addition to using topical anti-inflammatory creams to help the symptoms. So often with regards to sesamoid fractures, they can heal. Also some people have what's called a bipartite sesamoid where there's actually a split in one sesamoid bone where just as you were born and developed that way, you have a split in the bone. So many people do have this and also about 10 to 20% will have it on their other side as well. In regards to sesamoids, they do typically heal, but if there's continued pain, sometimes it does require surgery in very rare circumstances, excision of it. But often I try to treat these non-operatively in order to help with one's symptoms. So as I mentioned earlier in my lecture here, but for plantar fasciitis pain, it's a tough condition. I remember having plantar fasciitis as a resident where it took about seven months for it to go away doing non-operative treatment, but it finally did. So sometimes people's symptoms can last quite some time. So it's important to really stay committed to any treatments. Some of the treatments I mentioned earlier include doing 
pain medications such as anti-inflammatories or topical anti-inflammatory cream, stretching, supportive footwear, cushion orthotics, as well as sometimes we, one can use like an ice water ball where they roll over their foot over it in order to help break up some of the scar tissue. It's a quite painful treatment to do that, but it does help and make a big difference at the end of the day. So with regards to broken toes, that's quite a common injury. I'd have to know exactly how far out that person is from when they actually did break their toe. But it's usually a broken toe takes about six to eight weeks in order to heal enough for pain symptoms to usually often go away. If they're taking longer for those symptoms to go away after kind of a couple months, it made that the bones have not healed in, which means it's called a non-union. Or there could be just the constant buddy taping of the toe keeps putting pressure on the toe to pulling it away, which can also actually delay healing. So oftentimes I usually don't recommend buddy taping one's toes because it's actually painful trying to wrap the toes up in tape for the patient.